Hey, Project Zion podcast listeners, it's Blake Smith again, and in honor of the 40th anniversary of the ordination of women in Community of Christ, we're going to once again reach back into the archives and revisit a couple of extra shot episodes on the topic of women in the priesthood. This particular episode is a combination of parts five and six of that six-part series originally recorded by host Brittany Mangelson and guest David Howlett. And it features podcasts that were a project for one of David Howlett's classes at Smith College and features his students who did all of the writing and editing and production for these episodes. Again, this is part five and six, and it originally aired in 2020. We hope you enjoy. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Project Sign Podcast. This is Brittany Mangelson. So I have on David Howlett. David is a scholar and a historian and a professor at Smith College in Massachusetts. And his students recently did a class project that might have some interest to the Community of Christ crowd, whether you are a lifelong member or a seeker. And that project is a podcast on women's ordination in Community of Christ. David, I'm really excited to have you on today. And why don't you share a little bit about yourself? So I'm a professor, a visiting professor of religion at Smith College in Northampton, Massachusetts. I'm a scholar of religion in America with interests also more broadly in the globalization of Christianity, um, pilgrimage. And in specifically, the history of the community of Christ in the late 20th century. So I've written about that in books in the past and articles. And this in particular arises partially out of that interest, but also out of a class project where I have pedagogical goals, where I'm trying to help students learn things about historical research and um, other kinds of skills, in this case, about how do you write and produce a podcast? This particular project is about women's ordination in Community of Christ, thinking about how did that process in terms of the women's ordination movement originate, what was it like in the 1980s on the controversy over women's ordination, and what were the experiences of women who were ordained? Now, that in itself, it's important maybe to our audience in terms of people being Community of Christ or interested in Community of Christ. They could find something interesting in that particular story. But it's also a story that's larger than that, of talking about late 20th century American Christianity. And in the 70s and 80s, there were lots of fights and denominations about could women be ordained? This is true also of American Jews. This is true of American Buddhists. It's a much larger phenomenon. So it's a phenomenon thinking about who has access to social authority and power and who can be empowered in a community. It goes much, much larger than a relatively small denomination. So, and we see different kinds of responses and donations everywhere. For instance, the Southern Baptists in the same time period take away women's ordination from women who are already ordained. Um, And so other groups give it to women uh, who hadn't offered it before. So there's no inevitable outcome that comes in this story. And the story of our denomination too is a variation of the story that exists out there. There is an accompanying website along with the episodes, and the accompanying website does have some images from the archives that we have uh, shared with permission. And it also has a student's generated essay just giving background to women's ordination and community of Christ. And that student, by the way, quoted a Brittany Mangelson in that essay, believe it or not. (laughs) I noticed that, actually. (laughs) So there we go. Oh, that? that student did that research on her own. I didn't point her to that at all. So, I mean, she found that by Googling and then she's a good writer. And it's intended for someone who has no background in community of Christ to be able to understand, well, what's going on here? Who's just interested in the idea of women's ordination. Yeah. So, the website helps situate that a little bit more too. 
Yes. And we will be sure to link that website in the show notes so you can get more background information on the project. And yeah. Thank you so much, David. Thank you for uh, joining us in this collaboration. I'm, I'm really excited about it. Well, thank you for hosting us and giving us this opportunity. This is Women's Rights, a podcast about women's ordination, written and produced by students at Smith College. Hi, I'm Lily. I'm Annalie. And I'm Svetlana. We're your hosts for this episode of Women's Rights. This season, we are exploring the story of women's ordination in Community of Christ, a church with a quarter million members formerly named the Reorganized Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. This denomination began ordaining women in 1985, and on the 35th anniversary of these important ordinations, we're taking a look back on the journey towards women's ordination in Community of Christ. To do so, we've interviewed some of the first women ordained, women who went on to be leaders in Community of Christ. Each episode in this series investigates a different topic, and today, in our sixth episode, we're going to look at issues of interfaith ministry. We asked these women to reflect back on their experience across denominational lines with other women clergy and with denominations that do not permit women to be ordained. We initially asked our interviewees how they have served in ecumenical or interfaith spaces and how have people reacted in those spaces to their ordination. Many religions and Christian denominations do not ordain women. However, despite these differences between Community of Christ and other faiths, a variety of ecumenical relationships, connections, and interactions exist between them. We wondered what these interactions were like for the ordained women we interviewed, and whether or not they felt accepted and respected by those they connected with. I serve often for the church in ecumenical ways. So, for example, when 9-11 happened, Um, the presidency of the church decided to open up our auditorium in Kansas City to the community and said to me and one of uh, the apostles, asked if we would work with the ministerial alliance to plan something while that space was open for people to come in um, because people were really um, upset and searching for answers after 9-11. Um, And so I helped lead that effort, and it was quite interesting. Um, The Catholic Church, of course, was very present, and I had really good relationships with the liturgists and people involved um, in that community. And I really think it boils down to relationships, because I had good relationships with them. They were not opposed to me being a minister. even though in their own church, women are not ordained. Jane Gardner is the first woman to serve as presiding evangelist in Community of Christ. Marge Tro, one of the most important figures in the fight for women's ordination in the church, also spoke about her and her faith interactions in the 70s and early 80s. Well, I said I was on the National Board of Church Women United. I was on their ecumenical development team, and we were having a team meeting went out to the airport to pick them up. And they said, you know, we got to talking on the plane and we realized we have never worshiped in a church of your faith. Would it be possible for us to come and worship at your church on Sunday? And so there was the one time when there was an intersection between women of my interfaith community Mm -hmm. and members of my Community of Christ community, were there together. Charmaine Shavala-Smith, who was among the first women ordained by the church in 1985 and now serves as the Community of Christ Seminary's chaplain, described her experiences serving among members of other faiths. So uh, one of my probably earliest um, involvements in an ecumenical setting, uh, once I was ordained, was um, in Mount Pleasant, Michigan, And in the hospital there, they didn't have a full-time chaplain. And so various denominations in the area had banded together and they had a training program so that um, that basically they had the 
the hospital covered all the time with ministers from one denomination or another. And we had several in our congregation who were involved in the in that hospital chaplain program. And so that was one of the first um, opportunities I, I had as an ordained person to um, be involved in in ecumenical and community ministry. There was the ecumenical part as far as the fellow chaplains, but then there was also the ecumenical part uh, within within the, the visits to patients. And, uh, and, and of course, the main thing there was that we were not promoting our own denominations. We were present for the people and, and the need to, to pray with them or just be present with them. And moving on to our second question, we asked Community of Christ ordained women if being ordained had changed their perspective on other religions or denominations' choices and opinions on women's ordination. In regard to the question, Jane Gardner responded, When I look at other denominations, I think it's important to offer to share our experience. And I I don't know, I continue to have really interesting insights. So I went to a SDI, which is Spiritual Directors International Conference, and almost everybody there were women. There were almost no men. And you know, spiritual direction is kind of grown up through the Catholic faith, um, the Catholic church, but it has become more and more ecumenical. Well, it was so, I was so um, interested in hearing the women, the Catholic women talk about being spiritual directors. And the more I got to thinking about it, in my own perspective, I could not understand how women in the Catholic church could justify is probably not the right word, but live with the fact that they could never be in the priesthood, they could never be ordained. Um, But going to this conference, I'm listening to these Catholic women, and I realized that through this um, spiritual direction avenue, that they were expressing their calling, their sense of, of ministry, and they were just doing it differently than I was. And um, even though they're their denomination doesn't allow women to be ordained. They were still finding ways to offer ministry. So I, to me, that was really has been eye opening so that it isn't you have to be priesthood for any ministry to happen. That's not true. Ordained in 1992, Becky Savage was the first woman to serve in the first presidency in the church's history. She shared her perspective on women's ordination with us. Um, I think, if anything, I'm probably more sensitive to those who have a yearning for their own ordination. So we walk with other denomination, denominational women who are serving in ministry and, and have their own obstacles and run across their own issues. Um, and we can be collaborative with them because we, we are women in, who walk side by side with men in an interfaith and ecumenical way. So There are very few denominations who have ordained women. And so when you walk side by side with other ordained women, you are colleagues and you find collaboration because you walk side by side in common with common issues. So in that sense, I I think it's just more of a sensitivity and an empathy for other women, ordained women, and for those who do not have an opportunity to be ordained because of the denominations in which they have their faith. And finally, Charmaine Shavala Smith explained her feelings on other religious groups' opinions on women's ordination. I would say that perhaps initially I was quite understanding of why denominations struggle uh, with ordaining women. And but I think the longer that it has become normative in our denomination, um the harder it is to imagine that not having ordained women allows you to treat women equally. Uh, it's been harder to imagine that not having ordained women means you can still treat women as of equal worth to men. And so I probably could become less patient, and less tolerant <laughs> over time uh, with denominations that especially those who even refuse to um, to begin the dis- to begin a discussion you know wherever it might take them uh, for those who have already determined 
that God is male or, you know, whatever uh, is the, is the block or that women are less than or not as spiritual or not as good prayers or whatever it is they might use as their justification. I I'm finding myself less, um, under, less able to respect that. And that's maybe not a good thing on my part, but because it's just become so, so ingrained in, in our denomination to see, uh, see that there doesn't need to be a distinction between men and women when it comes to uh, bringing God's love to the world. Each of these women in their own way discussed the external and internal tension they face in their interactions with women, whether ordained or not, of other denominations. The third and final question we asked our interviewees was, do you think that women's ordination has changed the relationship that Community of Christ has with the LDS Church? What about other churches? Most of the answers we received focused primarily on the LDS Church as opposed to other churches, and no two responses particularly echoed each other. Some responses, such as Gwendolyn Hawks Blues, the first African-American woman ordained by the church, emphasized the positive relationship between the two denominations. In very brief encounters, brief encounters I've had with uh, some Mormon women at a, at a um, oh God, John Whitmer Society event I went to, there was appreciation for the fact that women were being used in ministry in the community of Christ. You know, so I think there was a there was a positiveness about their relationship with the women who were who were priesthood members there. Overall, you know, I, it's, it's simply another way for uh, those individuals to to see God's work in a faith community. I can't speak for how it affected those in the individuals, but I think positive. Here, Gwendolyn implies a positive coexistence or a level of respect without a desire to change the other denomination's structure between the two denominations. Although we only have one perspective, from this response, we can conclude that there is a great level of respect between the two denominations as they view each other's systems of ministry, prioritizing each denomination's relationship with God over the priesthood positions anyone can hold. Another perspective which was introduced by Charmaine Shavala smith is the idea that Community of Christ has become a safe exit from the LDS Church for those who are bothered by the restrictions on priesthood. For some um, LDS folks, our, our church has been, a, I think this is a healthy way to look at it. I'm not sure that others do, that, that we're kind of a way station, there, that we're a place where they can come, they can recover, they can be reminded they are loved by God. Uh, there's a bigger world out there that, that um, can, can and wants to, rec- wants to recognize them as Christians and their commitments as Christians. Um, I think we've become realistic with the idea that we're not going to be the, the place where uh, we call them LDS seekers. Uh, so the latter day, the Mormon seekers, we, we are, we may not be what some LDS seekers need uh, permanently, but we can be a way station that gives them a safe exit point um, and can help them start to adapt to a bigger Christian world. Um, and sometimes we'll be able to help them move on to a a denomination that will be a a good fit for them. Or maybe if they decide not to align with uh, another denomination, at least to know that there are people who believe that this God is a loving God and that they can still have a relationship with God. Uh, They may have to let go of some of the images of God that they have, but that the experience of God that they've had is not invalid and that they can uh, perhaps let themselves be known as a loved person to themselves as well as by God. And so we can, we can give them that. Charmaine's response implies a level of discord between the two churches that Gwendolyn did not allude to. 
While this quote speaks positively of the relationship between Community of Christ and those leaving the LDS Church, it indicates the fundamental differences in priesthood structure as a point of contention between the LDS Church and Community of Christ. Carolyn Brock, once active in formation of the Church's ministries and now retired, also points to this discord in discussing her own view of the LDS Church as Community of Christ moved towards women's ordination, and the LDS Church maintained their patriarchal structure. If anything, it only strengthened my idea that they that maybe the LDS Church remained more and has remained more patriarchal, and that they took some of the things that we maybe thought of as distortions that came out of the Nauvoo period and kept those, not all of those, but many of those. And I I see those as um maybe distortions or patriarchal kinds of movements in the tradition. So I might even be more critical, if you will, um, in my thinking towards them. And I've Between these three responses, we can see that there is a wide range in women's views of the relationship between the LDS Church and Community of Christ. Some view the relationship as respectful and distant, while others sense some tension between the two denominations. In our next episode, Changes, we'll look at how women's ordination has impacted these women's lives and how it has changed the denomination as a whole. That concludes our podcast for today. Special thanks to Jane Gardner, Charmaine Chevala-Smith, Marge Tro, Gwendolyn Hawks-Blue, Becky Savage, and Carolyn Brock. Also thanks to Dan Bennett, Travis Grandy, and Yasmin Eisenhower of the Smith Learning Research and Technology team. Thanks to Rachel Killebrew of Community of Christ Library Archives. And thanks to the Andrew Mellon Foundation that supports public-facing student writing at Smith College. See you next time on Women's Rights. This is Women's Rights, a podcast about women's ordination, written and produced by students at Smith College. Hi, we're Zoe House, Clara Brocarlat, and Esther Kearns. We're your hosts for this episode of Women's Rights. This season, we are exploring the story of women's ordination in Community of Christ, a church with a quarter million members, formerly named the Reorganized Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. This denomination began ordaining women in 1985, and on the 35th anniversary of these first ordinations, we're taking this season to look back on the journey towards women's ordination in Community of Christ. To do so, we've interviewed women ordained in the first decade after the 1985 policy change women who went on to be leaders in Community of Christ. Each episode in this series investigates a different topic, and today we're going to look at the theme of changes. How has ordination affected and changed the women who were ordained in the late 80s and early 90s? And how has women's ordination changed Community of Christ as a whole? We're going to start off by hearing from several ordained women about how their personal faith has changed since their ordination. Gwendolyn Hawks Blue responded, I don't know that my faith has changed. (laughs) I think it's, well, if anything, um, the feeling I might get is that God can use anyone, (laughs) you know? Uh, So I don't know if that's so much my faith changing as at a more personal level, embracing that understanding. I mean, it's one thing to have it at a head level and it's another to have it at a, uh, both an emotional and spiritual level. Along with Gwendolyn, many of the women seem to observe a difference between their faith, quote unquote, changing completely versus their faith developing, growing, and maturing. Charmaine Shavala smith expressed this distinction well. My own faith it just keeps changing. Uh, <laughs> I mean, not in, not in the most elemental ways. I think um, at the foundation is still this 
absolute assurance that God is present and loving and, um, and calling us to be our, our, our best selves and, and offering to help us do that. Um, so those pieces haven't changed, but, you know, I think it was trying to think of a specific, and I think like in regard to prayer, that's a place where my faith has changed and is still changing. Many of the ordained women talked about their faith journeys as them becoming more aware of and receptive to the spirit. Gwendolyn observed this in her own life. One of the things that challenges me always, and I hope in a sense that never goes away, is equipping myself as much as I can spiritually to to be open again to God's spirit to guide me in whatever it is I'm doing. Um, And that's a work in progress. One's own faith is highly personal and intimate. So we are very grateful for being able to listen to these ordained women's insights into their ever evolving spiritual journeys. Next, let's find out what advice and support these ordained women would give, based on their own experiences, to other women who are newly called to the priesthood. Jane Gardner explains that deciding whether to accept a call to the priesthood requires careful thought, as well as patience. My probably number one advice would be to not be in a hurry, um, to really give it a lot of prayer and thought, and um, see if it's a good fit, see if it makes sense in their life. And sometimes God calls us when it's uncomfortable. It makes us stretch. Charmaine agrees that becoming ordained is a serious, humbling process. At the same time, she advises women to not let their ordination status define them completely. Don't let this determine all of who you are. It's part of who you are, um, and it's part of your relationship with God. But your relationship with God needs to be outside of that as well. So, so, so keep being open to uh, just, just be being deep and spiritually beyond that call. Uh, it's not the end all. There was a time in our church where being ordained was a bit of a, an end all. Uh, it proved that you had value and, and don't, don't let it be that because it can hold you back. A final piece of advice for women who are newly called or ordained is to find a spiritual mentor. Linda Booth serves in this role and describes how she makes herself a resource for women who have been called. The first thing I do is share with them my testimony of their call, my assurance that God has divinely called them. And we talk about it, and we talk about their fears, and we talk about their excitement, and all the different feelings that they might be experiencing. And then we end with a prayer where I pray a prayer of blessing for each one. And then I continue to pray for them, and they know that I'm praying for them. (laughs) And, And I always allow myself to be open to a phone call or an email from someone who says, um... I have this experience and this is being asked of me. What do you think I should do? So now that we've heard the advice that women in the priesthood would like to give to newly ordained women, let's find out what work still needs to be done to make community of Christ more equitable and inclusive. The women interviewed for this podcast series felt that while great strides had been taken place to make the community of Christ more equitable and inclusive, more steps still needed to be taken. Gwendolyn talked about how a greater effort could have been taken by the community of Christ to help newly ordained women, especially those with further marginalized identities, to move into leadership roles. And there were no particular you know, efforts made to include me. But neither do I know how much they got together. So as I said, I have to lay the responsibility on both of us. Perhaps I could have said, well, hey, you know, I'm over here dealing with this. You got any ideas? 
She suggested that the church should provide a clearer structure to help newly ordained women move into their roles. Gwendolyn also hopes that the community of Christ improves in the support of marginalized identities. If the idea of a woman of color being in the priesthood did not say to them, hey, maybe she needs a little more help than some of the rest of us do. You know, I, I don't know what went or did not go through their heads, but I know I was the only woman of color in the mission center. Gwendolyn talked about the role of spiritual training, saying that. I think there's a lot of value in having that more formal training. Jane feels that. We have work to do um, to help women um, see themselves in these roles. She talked about the importance of encouraging women to ask questions of. What does it mean to offer yourself in service and ministry? And pragmatically, are you able to do it? And, um, and I think at the heart of it, do you feel the call? Do you feel like God's asking you to move in this direction? Gwendolyn also reflected on hopeful signs demonstrated by an increase in diversity in high-level church positions. Now, for many years, uh, as I think I said in a previous conversation, when I would go to conference, especially when I was younger, you would look up on the rostrum of leadership and you'd see white men. And that was it, period. Um, That broadened to be some men of color, very slowly. Um, And then within the last, gosh, 10, 15 years, women appeared uh, in leading as apostles. And, And as I said, this is the second, Stacey Cram is now the second woman who has been a part of the first presidency of the church. So the roles have been open. I mean, once it was open, and now I don't know if I would have traced from the very beginning of women's call in the late 80s to now, I don't know how rapidly that occurred, but it has occurred. You know, that women were seen in every role. Gwendolyn also talked about the importance of increasing the inclusivity of members' opinions. One way this is being done is that. Now at conference is when there are issues that are particularly um, sensitive or around which people can have pretty intense emotional reactions. Uh, there are efforts to work toward more consensus. And by that, I mean, not up, down, yes, no votes, but putting the question or concern there and, and having the opportunity to have full support, limited support, no support, you know, varying degrees. And that approach uh, has been taken with regard to open communion, or uh, was taken rather, uh, looking at uh, questions about sexual orientation. She felt that taking this type of approach would help the church become more inclusive for its members going forward. Charmaine talked about how second wave feminism and women's ordination in the 1980s began as a process of revealing blind spots in the church and wider culture. And this process needs to continue. I think the movement that that feminism started making happen in our church um, needs to spread to other blind spots that we have. You know, I, I say that um, any individual or any institution always has blind spots. We just don't know what they are yet. And they are often uh, limiting 
the ministry we can bring or how or or blinding us to how we see other people and that there's always a need to keep recognizing our blind spots. She continued to reflect on what this meant for women in the church and American culture. Um, but I think as far as women are concerned, we are, we're in a, a time in, the, in this culture um, where we've been going backwards. We've been going backwards so quickly as far as the rights of women. Um, and right now there's parts of culture that are threatening, threatening women, threatening children, threatening people of color, uh, immigrants. Um, and, you know, my hope is that things like the struggle of to ordain women in a, in a denomination that was not prone towards that kind of change uh, would give us eyes and a heart to be sensitive to uh, what equality can look like and what it needs to look like. Finally, Charmaine thought this search for equality has continued in the church's present day inclusive policies on gender identity. However, she noted... Unless we hang on to um, the recognition that uh, it's, it's not a fair world. Uh, it's a world in which those with power um, continue to make sure they have power. And um, that means there's somebody who's less than you. Uh, and, that's, and if we don't question that, then, then we've lost some of the momentum that, of where we've been. As we've heard today, many changes have come out of the ordination of women in the community of Christ, both on a church-by level and on the individual level of the first waves of women who were called to the priesthood in the late 1980s and early 1990s. Although the work is not complete in the church, during the 35 years since women's ordination began, the community of Christ has made significant strides towards inclusion and equity. This has been our final episode in the series on women's ordination and community of Christ. Thank you for tuning in to Women's Rights. Special thanks to Gwendolyn Hawks Blue, Charmaine Shavala Smith, Linda Booth, and Jane Gardner. Also, thanks to Dan Bennett, Travis Grandy, and Yasmin Eisenhower of the Smith Learning, Research, and Technology team. Thanks to Rachel Killebrew of Community of Christ Library Archives. And thanks to the Andrew Mellon Foundation that supports public-facing student writing at Smith College. Tune in next time on Women's Rights. Thanks for joining us here at Project Zion Podcast. You've been listening to reposts of Extra Shot episodes originally recorded in 2020. If you'd like more information on those episodes, you can find it at projectzionpodcast.org. Go to the episode quick list and scroll down to Extra Shots episodes 70 through 73 and 75 through 77. Have a great day.